welcome to our last event, our last uh, lecture, uh, talk, presentation, if you will, of our ongoing series. Uh, there is going to be another series next semester, but this 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 is the last one for now. Um, today we will um, watch, cheer, um, observe, discuss the projects that were uh, awarded by the language committee. Some of you are members of our committee. Um, about a year ago, uh, and over the course of the past year, the, um, the laureates were given the time to develop them, and um, today we will see what they were able to accomplish. Um, there's some, some very, very good projects, and uh, hopefully uh, they will be inspiring, we'll find them also stimulating uh, to, do, uh, to undertake something similar or something different in your own classes. Um, the applications for these projects for the current semester uh, were due the Friday after Thanksgiving, but not to worry, there's going to be another round in the in the spring semester. So if you're interested, in, uh, you're able to apply at that point. Uh, this event is going to be recorded, actually it's already being recorded, um, so if there's anything that you've missed, um, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can watch it. Um, at that point, I don't really have uh, much to add by way of the introduction, um, and I'm just going to go right um, to the heart of it. Our first group of presenters uh, will be, um, I'm going to start with uh, Alexander Polskovich, Alexander Bekov, and Ilicic. Um, and they will present this project uh, for uh, that encompasses a pretty, pretty comprehensive suite of materials for the teaching of Boston Information Survey. Um, without any delay, I would like to invite you here and the rest of you to welcome. Um, it will be difficult for kind of work. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for, for coming today. Um, um, I will say a few words in the beginning. Um, so, Bosnian Croatian and Serbian is taught by a solo language teacher, and I was privileged last year to be um, to have uh, opportunity to um, work with the graduate students for the first time. And um, it's usually when you spend a lot of time with one person, we don't see um, any um, in life, right? When you spend time with one person, we don't see uh, any kind of disadvantages. And something similar is with the textbook. We don't think about that things don't work in the textbook. But when you have another person involved in the same textbook, then the red light starts to uh, appear. And that's what happened with, uh, with my collaboration with the grad student that is Milica Jolicic. Uh, so we start to talk about uh, how this textbook could be improved, what we could do besides the hand, uh, handouts that we already have developed, that I actually uh, had prepared. So um, we came to the idea to start to develop materials and very uh, soon, um, so these materials are for the first year uh, and very soon this, uh, this material, this project actually became something more uh, serious so we decided to apply for the grant and the grant um, had to address developing uh, the language learning companion for the first year, entire first year that will uh, be uh, compatible with the textbook that we are using. Now, uh, after the fall of the former Yugoslavia, uh, this thing with language became much more political. Uh, so before it was a Croatian language, and then after the, the myth of Yugoslavia, it started to be called Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian. But it's basically the polycentric language, like German spoken in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. It's the same language, it just has different standards. Um, and this is the only, the, the only textbook that is existing in the um, Western world in, in English is written some 10 years ago and that's the only textbook on the market. Um, we didn't have, of course, the idea to develop the whole textbook, but we decided to develop the companion to that textbook. Uh, and most of the work uh, did uh, Milica and I served as a supervisor and helped her with the materials that she developed and she will talk more in details uh, about that. But I just want to say that uh, one of the um, one of the things that this project addresses are the challenges with the existing textbook. Um, this textbook that we are using has this complete separation of these three st language standards. It has also 
sometimes this ill contextualized vocabulary and grammar relation within it. Uh, as you can see, there are three columns of Bosnian, Croatian, and Serbian. Uh, there is uh, some vocabulary and grammar follows. Uh, but that th those exercises that are in the textbook are very often confusing. There is no space for writing anything in the textbook. Um, this is, for example, exercise. One of the exercises that it offers. It's usually mm, for the um, really boring um, kind of uh, change of vocabulary within the sentence and sentence structure. Um, and most exercises are also uh, pretty separated from the whole text. Uh, they are written in the language that is far away from everyday use of language and the main issue that we found is that there are no spoken exercises that would ask students to emulate life situations and the whole communicative approach is really hard to do with this existing textbook. Um, there are highly technical explanations of grammar that are really well done but more for someone who is a linguist rather than for a student who comes from the middle, from a high school and doesn't even know uh, the type of the words uh, in the sentence properly. Um, so the page layout is really hard to use within the SCI. I didn't mention at the beginning we teach this uh, as a less commonly taught language or should I say global, one of the global languages um, <laughs> within SCI and uh, we use, um, as we will see from uh, Alex Peckham's uh, presentation, um, we use this highly techni technical um, equipment, highly technically uh, equipped uh, classroom and it's really hard to deal with the existing textbook within the classroom because one has to switch from uh, what students see on the screen as a textbook to handouts that uh, we work uh, with as well and uh, all this like crossing and changing uh, between the textbook and the handouts uh, that feature exercises useful for the language instruction is kind of hard and is confusing for both teacher and uh, instructors and students. So um, also the textbook is completely black and white, it's, it's kind of dark in its design and pretty much inspirative for the students uh, for their use. So the goals of our projects were to focus most, uh, mostly on the content but also how this content will be presented through the design. And within, uh, within the, our uh, project we wanted to present all these language standards as uh, being together. So we decided to have a character stalking and each of these characters would use a different uh, language standard. And Melissa will talk more about how does that look in the language campaign. Um, also we decided to include the communicative exercises from the real life and implement them together with the grammar and vocabulary. Um, we played a lot, put a lot of emphasis on the visual clarity uh, of the grammatical exercises that are really close to the grammar explanations and um, to also have a really clear tasks for the students, which is not the case for the existing textbook. Um, of course, this should help ease of use and interactivity not only within the classroom but also for the students when they are at home and doing their homework, hopefully. Um, also, visual attractiveness uh, played a big role and engaging content that significantly changed from uh, what existing textbook has to offer. Um, there was a lot of uh, dis discussion between us how these new materials that we develop will work in the, uh, in the digital classroom. Um, this classroom, as Melissa will talk more in detail, is specific, so everything the students would usually have in their hands should be on the board, especially because of the distant students at the distant, uh, at the other end in the distant learning classroom. Um, so Milica will talk about implementation in much more detail. You will see how this uh, language companion looks. And then Alex uh, will take over. Uh, he is the, for the first time trying this. He is like a pilot in trying this, how it works in the classroom. And then I will wrap up at the end and we will be open for a few minutes. All right, hi, thanks for coming. Fun. Okay, uh, so some of the things that we started out, like Sasha explained, we had some goals that were mostly focused on uh, bringing in the communicative aspect, the, the visual design, using it to help understand dramatic information, which is quite, uh, there's a lot of it, there's a good, quite a formidable amount of material. Uh, the first thing we wanted to do was color code the three uh, language standards as opposed to separate them as different kinds of text, that's actually more difficult than it sounds because they overlap a lot and they overlap three ways. 
So it was challenging for us to figure out a way how to morph the same word into waves, into colors, and that was, it was like a design uh, problem. Uh, we wanted to introduce, because we were working with the digital material subject exercises, uh, we wanted to bring in as many pictures and illustrations and communicative situations, just bring in some color and bring in some fun into the uh, te uh, textbook. And, um, and, and perhaps most importantly, to have as much of the illustrations and the visual materials uh, that might illustrate a grammatical point. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, we had fill-in exercises. Uh, we wanted to have them, uh, like Sasha said, the separation of the exercise from where the new grammar is explained really made it difficult for students to complete a task. So we wanted to have things on the same page and adjacent and introduce a new grammar and new ending. We have a very rudimentary grammatical exercise right next to it so they can reference it before moving on. Um, uh, uh, each type of content also has a clearly distinguished visual identity, so they know when they look at an exercise, it's a written exercise, or this is grammar, or this is communicative, or uh, whatever it is. Uh, we wanted to still rely on the existing textbook because uh, it's, it does, it did give us a framework, and we did want to use as much of the existing material as we could. Uh, and eventually, this was kind of a plan, but as we started working on uh, creating communicative situations in all these contexts, we decided to throw in some cultural notes and materials and like just how people really talk, how people really interact in some of the situation culturally. Uh, so uh, as I started to work on this project, we actually, so initially I was supposed to do the write-ups of all of the materials as well as the visual design. I'm not a visual, I'm not a graphic designer, but I figured uh, I could learn to use a like, rudimentary a program that will allow me to integrate more images and more pictures in a more comprehensive way and in a format that was more suited to our keyboard. So that was the original idea. But uh, I went back to Belgrade this summer, and uh, one of my friends uh, sounded really delighted with our project. And she's a professional graphic designer. She worked before on, on the projects outside of Columbia. And, uh, my academic career, and she was like, she offered actually to do uh, professional visual design to donate it for a moment. So we were able to use the grant uh, to, to, without like sort of dipping into grant money, to obtain vastly superior visual design capacities just than, than we could print on. And uh, also, thanks to my brother for mobilizing some of his friends to greet each other, shake hands, and <laughs> do all those sort of very, very silly interactions that we need in textbooks. So because uh, I was able to outsource the, the, the graphic design in the most amazing way, we actually ended up creating a lot more content. I, was, I had more hours that I was paid for, so I had to use them in some way. I ended up writing more texts, I ended up writing more exercises, more uh, situations. So for example, the, in the proposal, we proposed, uh, we suggested two texts per unit. Um, I wrote about three or four for each. We were supposed to have like a total of six exercises. Maybe two writing, two grammar, two communicative. Right now, on average, we will have typically three, three types, ten grammatical exercises, ten written exercises, ten communicative exercises, and two audio recordings and stuff. One, and I should also mention uh, that we're also grateful to the people uh, in New York City who came in also uh, as volunteers to record the exercises, uh, which we couldn't have done on, um, by ourselves because we needed speakers of all standards and we were able to find people willing to, to help us out with that as well. So this is how I started out. This is how what the what I was able to create and write. And the originally planned uh, thing was maybe make it a little bit more colorful and add some pictures to that in a program that's not Microsoft Word. That was like the my uh, the original plan. But I was able this is actually what my graphic designer got. There, Descriptions of what needs to be there, what needs to be which color, what needs to go where. Uh, I described to her, please put a picture of this and that here, and then she goes like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, there's a, so this is a, these all illustrations are custom made for us. So we have activities, so we can use them as flashcards also, so we can them out. For vocab, we're learning different activities here. Uh, the, uh, there's a table on the top, they're learning verb endings. Immediately beneath, there's some table that's half filled in. Um, and uh, they have to apply the endings to other verbs they know. Um, and they can fill in all the blanks that are here. This is just a screenshot, so I cannot really show you, but this is every box is, you can fill it in. 
exercise next to it, and then they learn the vocab they write in, which the names of these activities that they're learning. Uh, these are the grammatical explanation uh, illustrations that I've, uh, I've asked for. These are some special letters that behave differently in different contexts. So we throw in some of these little pictures of them to remind the students that these are behave a bit differently. Um, there's uh, uh, words for different distances. Ovo is the closest, to is a bit farther away, ono is the farthest. Usually getting students to get that required a lot of jumping around the classroom and pointing to things and getting them to their back. But now we have a picture of a man showing a chair and it does everything for us. And finally, I think my favorite one is where uh, explaining the use of the, his own, as it, which is a separate um, the designation. So he loves his own girlfriend, is on voli svoju devojku, he loves Another man's, his girlfriend is on Molly Devil. So we see a sad man. I don't know if we can see that he's crying. Uh, so it's a, I think it's a, it's a very good mnemonic, and uh, the students that you like it. Um, this is another um, vocabulary illustrative thing. Uh, we have to use of exercises because they're not learning grammar, they're learning native foods, and then we're asking them to talk about their favorite foods and what they like and what they dislike, what's healthy, what isn't. Um, this is another communicative one. This is the, one of the real life uh, context situations where uh, these people have different schedules and they want to plan an evening together and there are some events that are in the city and we ask the students in the group to figure out what these three guys can do and so that nobody does something they don't like and everyone enjoys the evening. And then they continue talking about what they want to do this evening and what they want to do. Um, these are some of the pictures that we took. Custom made. I know all these people, they're very lovely. Uh, <laughs> very sweet. Um, and this is uh, this I wanted to show you. This is the, the, how the color coding works. So, Gde is the Serbian variant, Gde is the Bosnian and Croatian variant, uh, and they're all present. They're both present in the title, and the students are asked to read the one that they, um, to produce the, their chosen standard, but also be aware, as a native speaker would, of the other standards. Um, and this is, there's of course a color code in the bottom of each page, so that it's always very marked. Well, you can see that the three ladies over here talking about their vacation plans are each from a different standard. Blue, but yellow, and red, which is to say Serbian, Bosnian, Croatian, and they interact as native speakers would. They understand each other perfectly well, and they communicate freely. Uh, these are the self-check exercises, which are actually very easy to make. Uh, in, even in this rudimentary PDF format, because we just put different types of checkboxes. Some of them, when you check a, 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 like a box, it puts in an X. Sometimes, when you just insert a different kind of uh, checkbox, you, it checks with a checksum. So that, depending on what they will know if their answer is right or wrong. So it functions as a self-check exercise without really a lot of complicated programming that would make the document know anything about what they're actually with the actual text is. Um, this is um, another example. This is the grammar. We have our little images for the letters, reminding them which letters that the letters with hats, they take the vowel A, and the letters without hats take the vowel O. Um, right next to it is the exercise that immediately applies it. Um, this is a fill-in exercise. You can fill in those blanks. And the more complex grammatical elements uh, are blown out and rather than have like a really dense uh, textual description of them, you have like examples that are really big and visible. These are the badges I was talking about that signal which, which type of exercise it is. For example, this one is a handshake, this is a group exercise in the book, so this is a textbook exercise. We are actually referring to, back to the textbook and it's a spoken exercise uh, for, all, for, for the group. Um, and we add spaces that the textbook doesn't offer so they can look at the textbook exercise and they actually have a neat little space to write that with answers, which I think is really helpful in using what we have. Uh, these are, we added some, uh, as many stock images as we could, as many free uh, online image imagery as we could for, to, to show like, uh, some nice places in, in the three regions. Um, and this is one of our cultural notes over here. We're talking about how people greet each other with the where are you often rather than like how are you, for instance. Um, and um, finally, this is how this was much better. Hopefully, Alex will talk about it more. Uh, for the SCI classroom, first of all, we 
tailored the resolution of the images. Here it might have been like their screenshots, this is a projector, but on the actual e-board, the size and the resolution of the text was tailored perfectly to the screen that we have. Um, we, it was, we were hoping that having all the class materials in one file, and it was uh, horizontal rather than vertical, so we didn't have to sc scroll down. Scrolling really confuses students because they lose their spot. When you have it all horizontally on the screen, you don't have to scroll. You just have to switch pages and make sure that the, each page had like a finished <laughs> parcel on it. Um, the uh, interactive fill-in exercises, uh, you can see both sides, see what's being filled in uh, on the instructor side. Um, and we were able, we were hoping that the visual uh, description of the communicative task would enhance our speed of actually explaining to students what is asked of them, especially since uh, communicative exercises are especially challenging if you have a person on the other end of the screen. Um, so, uh, some remaining challenges, uh, I, I do want to point out that the color coding solution is not accessible, so people who with color blindness would not be able to use it. A uh, possible solution is creating sort of a mouse over function, where they would mouse over a, a circle and a letter would pop out, marking the dialogue, but that's a bit, a bit tedious to me. Um, and we found that when you separate these out to lessons, we tell lesson units, these PDF files work very well, but if you were to put them together in one big, huge file, uh, you would have a problem with the computer service. The, the computers often struggle to open because it's just so heavy, it has so many fill-ins and stuff like that. So we are hoping uh, eventually to migrate a lot of the interactive material to a designated website. <coughs> and Sasha will talk about that in the end. Uh, and now, the uh, hero who actually got to... Please, no exaggeration. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, yeah, I had the pleasure of studying to actually implement the language companion and start teaching it for the first time, so I will just talk a brief about how it works for me in classroom. As Melissa said, we, this is how a page of language companion looks like. You have grammar sections, view grammar. On the left, normally this is uh, assigned as a kind of foam preparation before in class practice, so students are expected to show up and be well equipped with this knowledge. But then we introduce some, can introduce some new bits in the middle is, for instance, the differentiation between, you know, accusative in going to direction versus uh, locative case, location, where at, something that, that is, you know, in terms of the flexion of the noun is a little bit different in Slavic languages, um, and not, not intuitive for English native speakers. And then a bit of the ambit, oh my god, sorry. On the right, we have a, an exercise, a filling exercise, where students need to differentiate between the use of two cases. So, at any point in class, on, each, on this particular exercise, students can themselves to sort of refer themselves back and revisit the grammar section without me even knowing this, right? Or asking questions. Sorry, sorry. You know. uh, or, uh, I as a structure can explicitly sort of um, refer them back to our grammar, grammatical section. Um, in terms of, you know, and th this might have something to do with my teaching style, but Melissa will talk a lot about the fill-in option. Uh, at this stage, Professor Boschkovich and I decided that we develop the skill of writing in hand, so students are expected to print out each page and actually fill it in, and, you know, <coughs> for the sake of mnemonic efficiency, so to speak, right? But we will definitely start using the fill-in uh, function in January, and thus developing a completely different skill typing in the language. So a little bit of summary of what, what I've just said. Um, yeah, we work on this particular exercise in class, and then this very exercise will be subsequently assigned once again uh, as part of next homework, where students will be expected to write out the you know, entire sentences. Um, right. Um, I'm a big fan of text-based uh, learning, and uh, the Language Companion does a great job in actually implementing this um, approach. For instance, in the very title of this text, uh, something that we'll talk about, differentiation between two standards, the Serbian core versus uh, Croatian core, um, and the um, sort of the new lexical and grammatical lights and Naslitsi on the picture, which is the use of locative. It's a wonderful phenomenon as far as the DCS goes, because we have the consonant alteration between K and C, again, something not you know, intuitive, even just by looking at the uh, dictionary form, which is nominative case. Right, and then we go over the text, um, 
it depends on, you know, like time capacity is how we do it. It might be one student reading one paragraph. Uh, there is one technical challenge that all uh, uh, SCI instructors are actually aware of, this signal delay between our classroom at Columbia and the classroom on the other end, in my case it's Yale. Um, so we cannot have, for instance, uh, phonetic reading altogether sort of inquire. Yeah? But then we break down into groups and the Yale does their own job in their respective classroom and we read with Columbia slash Bahamas students in our classroom. Then we have a reading comprehension exercise which once again revisits the Naslitzi construction, right? The students can answer these questions. Finally, we have the, on the upper right corner you see a picture where students are asked once again, the, the, the text title, who is in the picture? For Toya Naslitsi, the third time, or actually the fourth time, if we take this underlining into consideration, where this uh, item yeah, is introduced. And for the communicative, the immediately adjacent communicative exercise, once again, students are asked to bring a picture in class and ask uh, and tell us Toya Naslitsi, who is in the picture. So you see the same lexical and grammatical item is being revisited multiple times. It's text-based uh, and actually does a great job you know, for students to memorize this construction. So um, I am convinced that the, the best learning outcomes of our students uh, are actually based on this text-anchored approach. Um, and I, am, uh, I can tell you that the language companion does a great job in actually maintaining this consistent text-based approach. Um, I wouldn't assume that, uh, I, I assume that most of you know how teaching uh, in distant learning classrooms looks like, but for those of you who might not, there is a video sample that I can play, so this is how it looks like, two screens. On the left, the one I'm standing in front of is the content screen with all the materials which are displayed and seen by the remote students. On the right screen, we have Andrew, and the student Akil, and two students at Columbia. So, I'm going to play the video, I can do it from here, right away. And then talk briefly about the video. Good morning. The first one is the first one. The first one is the first one. The first one is the first one. The first one is the first So yeah, this is you know step by step process. We stay in Gapisoli. VCS has a wonderful phenomenon called clitics, short forms of object pronouns, and there is a whole strategy, a hierarchy of the use of those, and it's, it takes forever. Actually, I can tell you my experience. I you know I'm a sort of strangely heritage speaker of this language, but I was not exposed to it, you know, at, in the same ratio as to Russian, so I cannot strictly call myself called bilingual. Yeah, but it took me some time to, uh, you know, memorize this, and now uh, students are mastering this material uh, by the help of all the wonderful technology that we have here in the, uh, in the language companion. Um, Again, uh, this is just what we, you know, we had a video sample of it. Uh, this very daunting grammatical material with some of my um, circling, underlining going on using the open board features on the screen. And then um, we were actually dealing with this particular exercise on the right. I would also use, you know, what kind of object pronouns replacing the respective nouns for uh, the remote students at Yale to see it, because this is the content screen. Okay, and. Um, Another sample of situational text, as Melissa said, we have uh, three to four of those in each uh, lesson, item, um, sort of speaks for itself, we have the same topic, the word order with the clitics, um, and uh, some ideas about uh, what's been done, what can be done more, uh, so I'm, as I said, I'm me being a fan of text-based approach, I do believe that L LC does a great job in implemented this uh, thing. Um, oral practice is very much accessible for uh, students when the communicative oral exercises sort of outline a uh, clear strategy for them to follow step by step and that they are no afraid to actually enter communication despite maybe not even believing that already at this stage they can do, uh, they can do a great job in saying so much. <laughs> uh, and today I just 
taught and had a proof of it. <laughs> um, it's definitely worth uh, expanding this text-based approach onto, you know, uh, assigning uh, short essays, a writing exercises, and as I believe in spring, um, we'll work on it. Um, and also, what uh, what is worth uh, doing is designing a sort of overarching index that would include uh, all the declension and uh, conjugation paradigms for our students to easily navigate these reference materials from the review perspective. And a little bit of stats and some data, because sometimes numbers speak better, just like images, uh, do a better job in explaining how the stuff works. I can tell you that back in September, in terms of the ratio of using the old textbook and the language companion, I would say it was 30 to 70%. Uh, as of today, it's, all, it's virtually 100% of using the language companion in teaching elementary BCS. So I believe that this is a wonderful project that uh, Professor Boschkovich and Milica uh, designed and uh, will be the foundation of teaching elementary BCS at Columbia University. Thank you. Drop it up a little bit. Just where we can go further with this project. Obviously, this is this was in, it, it, this was imagined to be an experiment. It turned out to be what is done is way more than what we plan. Um, and I would say it's successful so far. There should be like much more fine tuning. That those things that we discussed to you us what which mistakes in, in some subtitles or titles we did or some context should be made maybe a better, uh, better kind of modeled uh, through the examples uh, for the oral, oral exercises. But um, the idea is to turn this from learning companion to something called digital textbook. Um, especially because we have in mind textbook that will not be printed, that will be used for this type of learning, which maybe is uh, future is in it or not, I don't know, but uh, definitely will be used uh, at Columbia, Cornell, at Yale. Um, for something like that, we will need to reorganize the lesson plans completely and also having in mind what language, uh, what um, language companion materials can be used um, because we were thinking of maybe opening with the different grammatical um, categories um, the whole first year than it is now uh, because we were following the existing textbook. Um, and of course, we're thinking of, of developing interactive exercises that are accessible online. And for something like that, we, we were thinking about website and to have a website dimension besides uh, these like, PDF uh, sets that will follow it. Um, but yeah, if you have any ideas uh, where we could go further with this project, that would be super helpful. Um, yeah, and thank you. I think this is like a teamwork and it work out uh, really well as such. Uh, you deserve credit uh, more than I do. But yeah, if, I don't know how we're going to do a day or we. Well, um, I was thinking about opening the floor for questions, comments, suggestions regarding the further development of this project or perhaps other questions you guys might have. And in the meantime, I will invite the next speaker to prepare uh, their presentations at the podium. So we have about 10 minutes to uh, talk about this amazing project. about what the implications are uh, of contaminating the language standard, what the implications are for someone speaking with a near-native phonetic standard who would contaminate versus someone who is clearly a language learner contaminating. Um, when you say contaminating, can you clarify? I mean, the, the mixing the, say, Bosnian and, standard. and Serbian standards. And That's a great question. I think there is a politics behind this. And the politics politic is anti-nationalist. Uh, current, uh, current situation on the market in these countries is that we would have specifically Serbian textbooks, specifically Bosnian textbooks, specifically Croatian textbooks. Uh, what we are trying to do is to put these in dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, which I think from American perspective or Western European <coughs> perspective makes more sense. What it is it may be problematic if we are in one of these three states. I mean problematic, when I say problematic, uh, the quotes. Um, 
<laughs> I'd also add that um, within um, they don't they don't really cross contaminate uh, within the learning companion. We don't just smush them all together. Rather, we have us like a text written in a Bosnian and like a different narrative delivered by a Serbian speaker. And when they speak with each other, it is clearly marked right. who is from well, I'm curious about the implications for your students. Yeah, if it's they go question. across. Or you know, what happens when when yeah. a native speaker goes across, either deliberately yeah. or by mistake? Yeah, then you have the. I mean, what experience. happens in the classroom? For instance, if we have a sentence where you know, the for cinema, there were two different words in Serbian. We all spoke in Kino in Croatian, and then my students at Yale, who, chose, who decided to speak Serbian, when seeing uh, Croatian Kino, he would read it aloud as Biosko. They do the job on their own. As you know, you know, I tell them they do not to navigate this on, on themselves, being given and being taught to do so on um, their own stage. But the idea is to learn these standards, to understand, for example, different standards. And I think that's, I, I explain that as an enrichment rather than contamination. And as a passive skill to, to, to recognize all of them, not yeah. necessarily to actively yeah. control all yeah, that's of them. Why so that's why they're all. Uh, and also when we teach those, like for example, we have Theoscope and Keynote, and we have like a three-way conversation with people, uh, we would have like a Croatian person say, hey, do you want to go to the cinema tomorrow? And they would use the word Keynote, and then the Serbian person would ask, yeah, I want to go to the cinema, and they would use Theoscope. So when learning these words, they would be exposed to both at the same time, and while they learn, they, they learn the standard they want to, and then further on they can just, just to back up with the existing yeah. textbook, they would be usually confused, like Kino, what's that? Or like Bioscope, what's that? They wouldn't necessarily, they would just be concentrating on the text that they are reading, and the text that other person is reading in another standard doesn't overlap. I still have Does questions in the second semester about like, can people understand each other across? And that's like, it's a, I mean, it's really hard to convey that the language is still intelligible uh, to everyone uh, when you have this clear separation. People still can't really wrap their minds about like, why would you separate if, if it's the same? So it's really mm -hmm. so, in, so in that case, they have to learn the three standards in truth. They have to learn to understand each standard but they can produce whichever standard they choose to produce. Well, it's interesting because in Portuguese we have something that's in Portuguese and the textbook that is being used uh, right now is a textbook that was written with the two uh, variants from Portugal and from Brazil and we have decided that that's too much work um, for the students so if I teach the Brazilian variation, then that's what they're going to learn. They're going to learn the Brazilian variation. And if it's a person from Portugal, then they're going to learn the Portuguese. We never ask them to do both. So that I find it interesting that in this case, because also in Brazil they just speak the Brazilian version, and in Portugal they just speak the Portuguese version. But here we're talking about speakers that are mixture yes. in the yes. same place and yeah. they're speaking all of the versions at the same time. Yeah. I think it's easier to get used to if because we started from the first year, from the very <coughs> basics, so that every text that is in, in the companion features a person speaking one of the standards. I also I think the necessity is uh, because Portuguese is still called Portuguese wherever it's spoken. And we have Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian. Uh, and a lot of times people coming in to still learn the language don't know that they're the same. So a person will look up online and do this colloquial offer, say Croatian. And if we just call it Serbian, or if we just offer it one standard, they will like, oh, I can't learn Croatian here. Too bad. And our enrollments, because this is a global language, are not too high, as we saw in Alex's classroom. So we do want and again, there are politics involved, and it sometimes can be very important to speak the right standard once you are in the region itself. We do fight, fight for the student. We want students to enroll, and then we have to play the game that this will satisfy everyone's needs. That's another issue. Um, so, one of the sort of pedagogical <coughs> challenges inherent in the shared course initiative model is that 
one site has the instructor in the classroom and the other one or other two does not. And so you're always trying to figure out a way to even out the experience of students across all three sites. And I was wondering, maybe this is really a question for Alex, to what extent does this type of material allow you to uh, give a more congruous pedagogical experience to the students on the receiving end of, of your shared course initiative class? Does it help to uh, make it so everybody's on the same page, so to speak? And if so, are there any specific examples or ways in which you found that it does that? That's a great question. I kind of cannot spontaneously give you a specific example thereof, but uh, definitely, I just, you know, I go back to September, like week two, uh, week one, week two of the semester, when we um, sort of were co using the, the old textbook, and I just realized it's confusing for everyone. For instance, it has those, I mean, I don't have a, a big problem with the juxtaposition of four texts because Serbian will be represented in as the following for that we actually for that mention that Serbian uses both Latin ABC and Cyrillic. So uh, all of our students, regardless of whether they decided to you know, learn Bosnian or Croatian, they are expected to master a new grad sort of uh, graphic system to even if they want to speak Croatian, they will still leave this course being able to access literature and text and website, you know, materials in this other graphic system, but just the design, you know, the, the interface of the old textbook on the just project that PDF is highly discouraging from working or doing anything with the text because in the little like type below the yeah each box it says replace this word with this. Sometimes I need to zoom in, zoom out. Yeah, it's a waste of time. And, and especially in the CSI course, I mean, you know, like in web week one two when I'm still mastering the technology. Yeah. No one's born with this knowledge of uh, work with this, but so. I don't know, the, the LC, because it's so, it's visually rich, uh, it clearly shows you how the text and the, you know, understanding the text, reading comprehension is sort of uh, prelude for the entering the communication. Uh, the only challenge is that, that has to do with my classroom. I do not always have my second part of the student at Yale, so that's why my uh, regular Yale student is, is very often on his own in the classroom, so I need to come up with this, a lot of pair work or you know, sort of uh, dialogues and uh, oral practice where he's engaged. But I just um, I'm kind of struggling to give you a real, really brilliant example of how uh, how this boosts, you know, the sort of um, uh, comfort, the yeah, learning comfort for the remote students. Oh, I'm going to interrupt for a second because we do need to move on. We have two more presenters. Do you have questions? Uh, pin them up, write them down. Um, Maybe just the last word. First of all, congratulations to your team on such a successful implementation of the LRC uh, grant. And if you're a, you ask for the next step, apply for the next one and apply. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving forward, uh, I'd like to introduce Lee Abraham of the uh, Latin American and Union Culture Studies Department. Uh, who will be talking about a uh, class that he and Stefan Aipos uh, co-taught in uh, one year ago, that was spring 2000. This year. Oh, this year. That's right. Mm -hmm. A previous semester. So, um, I'm just going to give you the floor. Mm -hmm. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your time. I thought I'd test the mic to make sure it's working appropriately. <laughs> uh, if, if you will bear with me, I have some prepared remarks, and then I promise I'll, I'll be a little more spontaneous, but I just wanted to contextualize the project a little bit within the work that's been done by the language community, many of you who, who were seated in front of me, so just bear with me for the recent remarks that go into more details about the, about the class. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending. Uh, I've already learned a lot from the previous presentation by Alex, uh, Nelitsa, and Alex. Uh, <laughs> and um, I hope that you will have some takeaways from the, from the course that I'm going to talk about. Many of you have already been working and are interested in pedagogical approaches with New York City and with other cities around the world. As all of you know, a few years ago, the Language Resource Center sponsored the Reading the City Symposium, uh, which focused particularly on many of the issues here. 
uh, as well as the workshop organized by my colleagues and I at Barnard in Columbia, focusing on pedagogical approaches to, uh, to the city uh, writ large. And I, and I should mention that everything that you're about to see doesn't occur in isolation. That is that there are many colleagues in my department who have been working with urban environments for many, many years prior to what you're going to see uh, that Stefan and I and Will Geary, who I'll talk about a little bit as well, put together. So I'll give you a couple of examples just to contextualize. Many of you know that Barbara Spinelli in Italian does work on, on, um, on this particular topic. In my department, Guadalupe Luis Fajardo teaches an entire course uh, for undergraduates on New York City as a theme. Uh, Elsa Ubeda in Catalan also teaches a course in Catalan focused on Barcelona. And so this is part and parcel of a lot of what we do in our department. Uh, there are a couple of others. Reyes Yopis Garcia does work on instructional technology through the, through the lens of the city, pedagogically speaking. Uh, Juan Pablo Jimenez Caicedo uh, talks about Afro Latin culture within New York City as well. And of course, two other colleagues, Francisco Rosales Vado, have focused on, has focused on um, artistic expressions of Latin American and Iberian art in the city. And last but certainly not least, Diana Romero has done some fascinating work on heritage language learning with the city as both text and context, which I think is important for us to keep in mind. So this is just one little piece of a larger puzzle uh, that occurs for many of the language community here at Columbia. Uh, I would like to thank Simon for the invitation to share a work in progress. And I say this is a work in progress because it's a long-term project where we're looking at notions of place-based and place-responsive education for language learning. Uh, to all of you, the language community of Columbia, who some of you may not realize have inspired the project through many conversations around the city, on and off campus, right? Uh, lastly, I extend my sincere appreciation to my colleagues on the language committee who supported and awarded the grant for this project, and also to Team LRC, Stefan, Piero, Rashan, Chris, and Darcy, who always provide invaluable assistance throughout this course and also throughout uh, many of the other projects with whom we work. Uh, with them on. Uh, I've had the tremendous pleasure, as Simon mentioned, to collaborate with Stefan and Will Geary, who was a graduate student who worked with us on the project, and I'll talk about that in, in a few minutes. And as you've seen in the previous uh, project with uh, Melitza and Alex, um, we have amazing students. And so I think when you look at this project, you should also look at it through the lens of a, a, a truly, much as you just saw previously, the beauty of collaboration with students, whether they be graduate students or undergraduate students, and the amazing work that they can do when we turn it loose to them and kind of loosen up the reins a little bit on the classroom. Um, one more thing I'd like to mention, that the project also uh, occurs within many of the other initiatives that the Language Resource Center and some of my colleagues have been, have been engaged in this semester. Uh, the multi-literacies piece, and the reason why I mention these is because I'm, I'm trying to get you to see the lenses through which Others in, in, in around the language community have been working on this. So those of you in the multiliteracies brown bag um, should readily see, I would hope, the topics that have come up in many of your readings as these relate to notions of place-based education in cities, or urban environments, or suburban environments, not necessarily the city. Um, there have been some talks by Heather Willis Allen and Agnes He this semester. Heather Willis Allen is focused on, focused on virtual reality, but also through notions of place. So it is something that we've talked about throughout the semester. Agnes He talked about heritage language education, but if you were at the talk, what is very obvious is that place among heritage language learners and immigrants is fundamental to their learning, and, and, and emotional and both physical connections with place also resonated in that talk. And I'd be remiss if you didn't have a chance, uh, a, a month ago, uh, we had a workshop organized by Fumiko and Jisook, uh, we focused on social network approaches. And when you think about social networking approaches, it's not just technology-based, it's also ways in which we bring communities of language learners together. And place is also an important part of that if you think about it in terms of both cultural and literary uh, knowledge. Uh, okay, let me get to the presentation which all of you have uh, been waiting for. Uh, patiently. Uh, I will talk about the project. Vis-a-vis -vis everything that I just mentioned, mind you. Uh, I'll share some examples and I'll discuss the workshops with all of you, I promise. So you're looking at a few uh, you know, street scenes from New York City. And what I want you to think as I'm going through this, because many of, 
Many of you may say, well, what's this about in terms of language learning? And I think if, the way I would say this to you is wherever it is you spend your time when you're off campus, there are language learning lessons all around you. Right? And, it, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. So think about how you came to work today, what you do on your summer vacation, what you do when you're not here. All of these lessons are around us. And that's what I hope the course that Stefan and I work with, with Will Geary, will, will get you to think more about in terms of some of the other work that was already ongoing that I mentioned previously. This is an interesting, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable was an architecture critic for the New York Times, and um, she passed away three years ago. And I happened to be reading the New York Times, and it's just one of those moments in your life where serendipitously you're reading uh, an article in the New York Times about uh, a particular uh, individual, and this particular quote kind of jumped out at me, and I, I revisited it in preparation for the talk today. And I think if, if somebody were to ask me what is the essence, that is, we are all in the humanities, and the humanities are on the side streets of New York. The question is how open we are to allowing that humanity and student-centered pedagogies in the classroom uh, more than anything else, and that's why you see the photos here. So we can look at it from a bird's eye perspective, or we can look at um, notions of place-based education at the level of the street all around us. And in particular in global cities like New York City, where there aren't any shortages of any of the languages that you teach. And for those of you who are wondering where is the language in the city, as you'll learn from Federica and Massimiliano's perspective, that notion of city or suburb can also be mediated through technology. Right, as you see sometimes, so it's not just that it's here in New York City, it's wherever and with whomever you're connected with virtually as well. Uh, so let's talk about the project a little bit. Twofold, two goals. Uh, it was very much a student-centered project, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you examples uh, of the projects that students put together, right? Uh, that was the, what drove the project, is that we were gonna talk about multilingualism in urban spaces, in different contexts, but that ultimately we wanted students to do field work with New York City as, if you will, the laboratory of the, the entire context for the course. So this is the title of the course that we taught, uh, Stefan and I, and these were the project objectives, but also I would fairly add are the course objectives, because really the LRC uh, grant aligned with what we would conceive of as the class, right? Um, so in many ways, uh, this particular course, even though it seems to be linguistic in nature, there are other notions of both literariness or literacy and cultural studies embedded in the course. And then we have another piece that uh, we thought was an important one, and it's one that's been discussed quite a bit recently uh, around campus and around uh, other institutions in higher education, that is digital literacies and skills. How do we work with visual data, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, what I'm going to do first is show you the projects so that you get an idea of what they were able to do uh, through uh, the workshops that we put together so that you don't have to wait until the very end uh, for the actual project. So as I mentioned, this was a culminating project uh, for the course in which New York City uh, became both text and context. And so in this particular case, one of our students decided to focus on languages at home and in the workplace. And so in this particular case, you see some research questions there, which I'm not going to read uh, to all of you. Uh, but this is something that, again, um, she was interested in exploring and understanding. You know, we have multilingual New York. It's been, you know, if you, there's a book written about with the multilingual Apple. And so to what extent does this multilingualism play out in terms of where people live and to where they live? Uh, and so this is the particular project that she put together, and um, I will make these slides available certainly if you want to look further. Um, where what she is attempting to show here uh, is, uh, each of those lines represents, as you can see here, commu uh, commuting from a particular place in New York of residence to another, uh, re um, to another, to a place of work in New York City. And she was interested in it. how multilingual is New York after we commute to the workplace, right? And so that was something that particularly resonated uh, with her. And so she, has put, she put this together in, in collaboration with Stefan and I, who guided her through the steps pedagogically, the research that was involved in terms of how to use census data, limitations of census data, 
And our graduate student, who I'll talk about in a few minutes, helped with a little bit with the visualization. So it was a very interesting collaboration between both data visualization expertise and an academic focus on what are some of the uh, issues involved in working with census data. Um, so that was just one of the projects that we have seen. I'll go to the second project. So this was an interesting uh, project that focused on uh, a student who was going to be doing some study abroad work and who had already traveled to Rio de Janeiro. And again, because this was a course focusing on multilingualism, uh, this was something that resonated with this particular student, Emma. So she was interested in the role of graffiti and other visual representations in the city. And as you may know, my colleague, Jose Antonio Castellanos Passos, uh, has, a, has a study abroad program in Rio de Janeiro, and Emma was one of the participants, but she had already previously uh, uh, been to Rio. And so these were the two questions that really resonated with her in terms of the readings of the product, of the course. And so she has used a, a tool called Time Mapper, and I might add that Simon has been offering a series of workshops this semester that fit and align almost perfectly. So if you're interested in these tools, as he said at the beginning, there's the LRC YouTube channel where he walks you through in one of his fascinating workshops how to use some of these mapping tools. And so again, this connects very well with a lot of the work that's been going on. So we let them choose the tool. Again, this is a student-driven project. So in a sense, what you see here is she has mapped she actually had 2017 data, but she since participated again this week, uh, this summer, which is why you see the July 2018 dates. Uh, and she has then commented out some of what she's seen there in Portuguese throughout the city. So this is her experience having taken the photos and having reflected on the course, uh, her experience in Rio de Janeiro. And she had done this part of the final project, I should add. Uh, there's extensive academic research done on graffiti and visual representation in urban environments and part of what she was working on. Uh, this was inspired by some of the readings uh, for the course. So those are just two of the projects in the class. Uh, and so now what I'm going to talk about a little bit um, is a little bit about the second part of the presentation. Uh, and that is uh, data visualization. Is big. We have the Data Science Institute on campus and it's um, uh, UC Berkeley is recently establishing a new col uh, college focusing on data science and data visualization, uh, as well as MIT. So this has been uh, at prestigious institutions, uh, uh, Columbia and those others, uh, an important initiative. So when we were thinking about the course uh, and we thought about ways in which we can work with data spatially, we realized that we really needed to have students work on processes involved, as you saw with the previous, there's processes or steps involved. So it involves data collection, data processing, and then visual explanation, and how to visualize. And this is where you see some of the literacy piece, right? How do students take the data, work with data, whether it's visual data, verbal data, and then put it together to literally tell a story about the project, which is really what a map will do in a way. So a little bit about the workshops, and I'm going to wrap up soon in, uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, we collaborated with Will Geary because the way Stefan and I envisioned our work is it, it's by its very nature always been collaborative. If you think about whatever you've done in life, in many cases, not all cases, it's through the, your success or your interesting work is always done in collaboration to many extent. So we worked with Will Geary. Will was a graduate student uh, who had already worked with some of our faculty in my department on projects. The, the piece there that's important is that he had already worked with students and he had already worked with faculty members. So even though he's a data scientist, he is also somebody who's, who is sensitive to issues of teaching and learning about data visualization in the classroom. Uh, and so these are the workshops. We will be making these available if you're interested uh, that he conducted with the students. Now the question is, how did he design the workshops? Well, he designed the workshops in collaboration with Stefan and I because we had a certain, we, so we aligned the syllabus for the course um, with the workshops that he provided because the worst part of that technology is when it becomes a tool that's completely, de 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 that's completely useless in terms of what you're doing in the classroom. Uh, and so we worked with him to kind of design some hands-on workshops which were part of the course. And for those of you sitting there and say, I teach language courses, what's in it for me? Any one of these modules which we're going to make available could be plugged into one of your courses to do an assignment or a task, which is the other hope that we have with this project. 
is it even though this is for an entire course focusing on student-driven active learning, project-based learning in the, with New York City, any of these can be used in the classroom. So I'll show you one that, that to me is one of the fundamental units that we talked to him about. And he talked about critical data visualization. Now we're all language teachers, and all of you teach upper level courses, and many of you teach upper level courses, so you may be saying, critical data visualization is one thing I think we need to reclaim as humanists. Our students are immersed in data. Where are the conversations about the kinds of data that they see out there occur in other classes? I think the language classroom is one piece when we talk about digital literacies, where we should talk about this, what, is, what are the limitations of visual data? What are the limitations of combining visual and verbal data? And so one of the very first units that we had to work with with students was this, right? What does an article do well? What does it not do well? What is it representing well? What is it not representing well? Because these are decisions that they as students working on the projects are going to have to work with, right? What, what kind of data do I want to work with? What are the limitations of the tool, right? Because as Leo Van Leer once said, it's the affordances of the environment that make for an effective pedagogy. And so we had him work, as you can see here, visualizing data. We'll make these available. But these are the kinds of hands-on workshops that we thought were fundamental uh, to the success of the project. And certainly, without Will, this wouldn't have happened. Then, um, as I mentioned, Simon is doing one, but we, um, we also had uh, Will talk with them about other data. And again, we'll make these slides available. I know I'm kind of uh, scrolling really fast. Uh, but. Uh, Maps are useful, but they need to be useful. The map is not the territory. So, yeah, he would walk them through a series of activities around that. Uh, and again, these are all readily replicable in your classroom. Visual representations of time is another one. And again, I'm not going to, uh, so that you see some, some tools that are involved. But those of you who know me know me well, that the tool, know me well, know that the tool must be in the service of the pedagogy. So if you, if, if you have activities or tests that don't allow for this, don't use the tools. It's very simple. But I'm not here to push technology. I'm not here to push mapping. I'm not here to push using New York City. If you open yourself up to the, to the possibilities, these are some options for you. That's all I would say to all of you here. Uh, but, your, but your learning outcomes have to address it, quite honestly. Uh, there are tools by the Knight Lab, there's Timeline, a variety of tools that many of my colleagues, some of you are already using uh, as well. Um, uh, these are some of the other workshops. Again, uh, census data is important. Uh, there was a, it's, it's something that is discussed when we talk about uh, uh, data analysis in other classes. And I think we need to reclaim some of this a little more in our language classes, particularly as we talk about innovating in connections with other disciplines. Uh, as well. What are the limitations? If we talk about language and identity, if you think about the census, that's a binary choice these days. There's female and male. So there are, these are the kinds of critical discourse discussions that a focus on data and language and multilingualism uh, can bring about. And so having uh, walked you through a little bit about what the courses were and the projects were, I would just say thank you. straight into an intermediate or advanced Spanish language class. Sure. Do you teach a course on Czech? Czech? you teach a course on Czech? I do Czech, yeah. Do you teach a course on Prague? Uh, I haven't tried to teach a course on Prague in Czech. <laughs> it, it, it's hard. Yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you a great, that's a great question. Here's a great example. Not for me. So these are maps of literature in the city. Because even though many of you may be thinking there's just a course on multilingualism, there is no way that you can't begin to address these other issues in the classroom. And to me, it's fine. I was trained as an applied linguist and a social linguist, but these are some of the more interesting issues that came out of the discussions in the class, right? So I can show you this is essentially um, how are you going to tell a story? Tell it through its literature, map it. So whatever it is you're teaching, whatever language, you can be talking about that. This is a great example uh, from Amsterdam. 
that we came across, where you see the, it's hard to, it's hard to read, but you can see there are literary quotes about specific pieces. So that can be done at any level, because we all use poetry. We, we've all seen Joel Neminetto, my colleague, talk about poetry in the classroom. If there's a poem written about the city that you teach, or one that which you're catching about, why not map it, put, show it in its, in, its, in its visual context? That's one readily example, right? If you have um, photos that you want to map, if you want to bring certain Czech cities alive, map them for them and ask them to comment on what they're seeing. Those are all kinds of low-level mapping activities where you can simply take a Google map and map photos of landmarks in Prague and do a virtual tour through uh, probably not a, a, city, a, a city of your liking. And those are, um, those are I'm sure, um, that Simon, who is much more technically adept than I am, would be, would be able to kind of walk you through steps of, of even in elementary Czech courses using a, a mapping tool to bring the culture of many of the Czech cities or countrysides, even though we focus on urban multilingualism, alive for students uh, as well. If you do um, collaboration, such as what you're going to see in about two minutes uh, with uh, Czech classes in, in, in the Czech Republic, um, or you want to begin to explore that, that's another way that you could be collaborating with them that way. Those would be very easy mapping tools you can do. Uh, to do that, but that's one example where they map uh, poetry onto uh, elements of the city um, that you could do. You could do it with a Google map, in other words, tag the, put the pin there and then show a poem that's inspired, because then they have a nice visual association with the poem, and it brings the poet alive in that sense. So if you have poetry that's designed, I think you can example in Czech, uh, but uh, that would be one way. Or a song about the city. If it talks about a particular neighborhood, what better way to have them visualize place in a song or in a poem than on a map? Those are just some ideas. I find them off the top of my head. Um, as we are discussing these questions, I'm going to sure, no. get to start sitting. What course were you teaching? Like, to what course did you apply this project? Correct. This was a course on multilingualism for undergraduates uh, that was taught in, in English, but that attracted uh, students from um, undergraduates in architecture, uh, an undergraduate in art department, Latin American Iberian cultures, uh, and uh, a student in comparative literature. So it was not, per se, a language course? No, no, it was not. Uh, having said that, though, any of the modules um, could be plugged into a language course along the lines of Chris's. Correct. Uh, the question I would, I would ask, the question, it's a great question. Uh, the question is, what is the role? Yeah, what's the goal? Uh, right, and in this particular case, how do you make cities come alive yeah. for students? Through, in this case, we focused a lot on social linguistics, but through literature, through music, through song, in ways that resonate. Um, uh, and so, when we put the modules up online, I think you will see, in, in, to some extent, that the tools, if you're interested in visualizing cities, or suburban environments, or areas of contact zones, which Mary Louise Pride at NYU, my colleague, talks about, um, how do you visualize that with students? How do you use notions of graffiti, transgressive uh, language, um, soundscapes, etc.? No, I know. I was yeah. <laughs> okay. I like that. So, um, yes. when it comes to visualizing in cities on the map, one of the things you might, one might consider would be to look into the pop cultural representations of the park certain locations, certain cities. Uh, and the one thing that I was just talking to um, Al, uh, Sasha about was uh, how Croatia and uh, Dubrovnik specifically is portrayed in Game of Thrones. And that would be very culturally current topic, very applicable to students, and also very interesting that that would allow you to sort of segue to uh, do some of the things that you just talked about. So basically you were uh, conducting a student or oh, helping students conduct a research project 
research Sure, I can I can talk yeah, I can talk about if you're interested in the because, because for us, I mean if you're not in a regular classroom, a language classroom, we would probably want to use maps differently, maybe you Sure. No, the, 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 the core of it, if you, if you wanted to, the core of the class, and again, this could all be done. You can have elements so of Maybe this. just present maps to students rather than having them drawn. No, I, I, I would approach it, I would, I, would actually, I would actually say, I would, take it, I would take a step back and say, what is the appropriate, what are my learning outcomes for the use of the city? or any aspect of language and culture in the classroom. And to what extent do these kinds of assignments align with those objectives? And it may very well be that you're not interested in mapping. You could care less about field experiences. You don't want to do photography. And that's perfect, but I can't, you know, that, those are objectives that, that all of you seated in front of me and those of you watching this online would think through in terms of whether or not this is applicable. In cities like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Paris, London, Buenos Aires, wherever it is you teach your languages or from wherever you're teaching, these assignments can easily be done. The question is to what extent you're open to having the city become part of your curriculum, or not. And I think that's the way I would answer it. If you're not, then I wouldn't pursue it. Okay. Thank you for this amazing answer. Yeah. <laughs> by Federica Franze and Massimiliano. No. Um, and uh, are, you, are you presenting here? No, no, no. Um, where we will learn about uh, telecollaborating overseas and the context of the Italian language teaching. Thank you so much. Um, I've actually already presented part of this project a while ago uh, here at the Language Resource Center. So you, and I remember some of you being here um, at my presentation, so you may ask, you may wonder why are you here again? And the answer is that uh, thanks to the uh, grant, I was actually able to bring my project to another level and um, in fact to do something that I've been wanting to do for, from the very beginning. This is a project that I've been uh, implementing in my advanced uh, Italian language courses uh, for about six years now, five or six years now. And it's done in collaboration with the University of Urbino in uh, Italy. Urbino, is, uh, that's the city where I uh, was born, where I grew up, and where I went to school. Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you how beautiful it is. <laughs> but um, I will just jump on to who are the participants of this project. Um, at the University of Urbino, there is a, a graduate program on uh, teaching Italian as a, a, a second and foreign language. And um, one of my colleagues, friend and colleagues for many years, uh, teaches there. And so we decided to uh, put together and collaborate in, in, um, in, the, in this project. Um, these students are um, enrolled in, uh, in a master's program and they learn just uh, to teach Italian. They become teachers of Italian. I'm going to call them pre service teachers. Uh, and the other participants are here in. Columbia and there are my students enrolled in one of my advanced Italian courses. What we asked them to do was um, um, meet online for uh, uh, lessons that the pre-service teachers have been teaching to my students on a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, meetings uh, via Skype. Uh, before I guide you a little bit through the structure, I want to tell you that the pre-service teachers in Italy uh, take a pedagogy course taught by, by my colleague um, about 35 hours in the, during which they uh, learn uh, lesson planning, uh, they analyze uh, teaching materials, they design material and learn how to design task-based uh, activities and they have a final exam that is designing a teaching unit. Up to the point where we, uh, you know, even before we actually implemented, we started implementing the project, this was like a, a theoretical lesson that we don't know if they ever used it. Then what we decided to do was to um, actually ask them to design a lesson and use it with my students um, so that they get to see how and if it worked. Um, this is a little bit how the, the project works. The pre-service teachers and the students are paired up and that happens 
pretty randomly because I don't know the teachers in Italy and my colleague doesn't know my students, so the matching is very random. Um, for the online lesson, we, lessons, we asked the pre-service teachers to design a grammar activity to revise um, a, point, a grammar point that I'm doing in class uh, and the communicative task. They have to uh, choose an article, a video, find a, a song and create an activities so that um, you know, they, they um, invite my students to, to talk. Uh, they have to follow a pretty um, um, standard uh, structure, I would say. Uh, they have to introduce the topic, so sometimes it's a review of the vocabulary or it's an introduction of the vocabulary. <coughs> they have pre-reading or pre-watching activities, then reading or listening comprehension, and then a final discussion that could be a task-based uh, uh, activity. They submit the material to us, <laughs> extra work <laughs> for us, we, have, we go over it, we give feedback, and once the lesson is ready, they submit it, they send it to their own student uh, via email and set the date and the time for the, for the call and for the lesson. So this is done all independently, they're responsible to decide when to do it. They, have, they get one week and that's when they have to do it. Um, we usually ask them, depending on the number of students, um, I don't have too much time to discuss on what happens every semester, every time I do it, because you know, we never know how many students, how many teachers are participating. So normally we ask them to, do, to meet four times for lessons and to have at least 30 minutes class. They usually go over and speak or you know, have class for about 40 to 40, 45 minutes. We also ask them to record. Uh, the, the lessons. Uh, and this is how it looks like on my syllabus. Uh, this is from um, an advanced conversation course. So uh, we meet twice here and I usually have um, you know, developed a topic that week. And the lesson comes at the end of the, that week. You know, from, from that time. Yeah, from, uh, from that time. So this is, we were talking about the city, the ideal city, and I guide them, I introduce the vocabulary, I review the vocabulary, I discuss the topic with the class, but then at the end they get their own like, ex extra lesson with their own teacher. And they have one week to do it. It doesn't matter to me when they do it, and I know how they, if they do it, because they have to fill out a questionnaire. Both the teachers and the, um, my students. I usually count it as a, depending on which course I implement the project into, um, it counts for 45 or 50 uh, percent of the final grade. Um, so they really, they have to do it. Um, we like to say that it's a win-win project because uh, it allows uh, the teachers in Italy to plan um, and teach within a technology enhanced uh, environment. It allows them to um, conduct, conduce um, reflective teaching and also to interact with uh, highly motivated students. As far as my students go, um, they have the opportunity to engage uh, with the topics discussed in class on a one-on-one -on -one, uh, session. And so they have really the chance to practice their skill and learn something new in an authentic, it's virtual, but it's an authentic space, um, and to develop their intercultural community skills. So it's, it's a virtual space, but it's a real intercultural exchange. And I never know, uh, we tell them the topic, as you've seen from my syllabus, but I never know how, what will come out of the, um, of the lesson until I see it. So, it, you know, it's, um, it's always a good way, another way to practice the vocabulary and uh, um, talk about the topic. Now, one uh, problem that we always, I always had, we always had, what do we do with all this material that has been created? And uh, we have an average of 20, 30 lessons uh, created by the pre-service teachers in, uh, in Italy. And tons of grammar exercises, activities, games, uh, ideas, tasks, role plays, videos. They come up with a lot. I learn stuff. They come up, they find articles I, I haven't had the chance to read. Um, you know, songs that I don't know, videos that I haven't seen, and it's a lot of cool material. I want to show you, uh, yeah, and no time to organize it because I also teach other courses, and I also spend time, um, you know, the, giving feedback on these lessons, so, I, you know, that's one thing I don't have time 
to, we never had time to do. I wanted to show you, um, just uh, to give you an idea, a couple of lessons. This is from uh, last semester um, project, and this was the topic of environment. And this is done by a you know, teacher to be. <laughs> Um, so again, it's a review of vocabulary, learning vocabulary, and the text. Uh, this is, yeah, uh, we don't have a graphic <laughs> designer. And then we have um, uh, activities like, you know, reading comprehension as a multiple choice, as open questions, and then final role play. I really like the way they go out of their ways designing these role plays because it's not just, okay, let's talk about the environment and what do you do. It's like really imagine like this one, for example, is like, okay, we're roommates, pretending, you know, we're roommates and uh, I, you are the perfect e ecologist, like you, you're careful about the environment, you take care, you recycle, me, I don't do anything, I don't have time, so you have to teach me and convince me to follow um, you know, and be a nice uh, citizen. Uh, and, and so, just to give you an idea, it's not just like, okay, now let's open up the conversation on um, uh, environment. Uh, this is another lesson about art. And uh, uh, she talked about her city, this, this teacher talked about her city, and, uh, and how it's linked with art and the artists that are born, you know, are. On, in, in her city, and this is again vocabulary exercise. Um, I really like this this, um, this one exercise. She used the TripAdvisor um, comments to revise the vocabulary of the city. Um, so they're actually using like also you know authentic material. Um, and then she had a video and uh, of the news. These are the news, so it's not like. Uh, you know, it's authentic material, and she has a multiple choice and uh, sorry, my true and false um, questions. Um, at the end, this is the role play. Um, you are responsible. Like sh they really have to take on roles, and this one, like okay, you're responsible to curate a society part, and what are you going to do with it, etc. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea. I have, like, so we, we have tones. This is another one. It was women and, and work in Italy. Uh, she used another way of introducing vocabulary, brainstorming, and then a, more, a matching exercise. And um, again, using authentic material to go through uh, the topic and introduce the topic, and then finally the reading and the questions. Um, so what do we do with all that? material, nothing until now, because I didn't have time, I just had my, we tried, we tried with Dropbox, we tried with folders, oh, here and there we have a book, a book. yeah, but there, is, there is so much material that, um, yeah, I don't even know where I put it, but I went to the language resource center, life for grant, and I got it, luckily, and I used it to uh, pay to two graduate students and, um, and work with us here, two graduate students from my department. Um, so, we opened up the collaboration also uh, in the department. Um, now, because Massimiliano is here and is going to actually tell you more of the, the core of what we did, um, because we are, we like to, me and my colleague and I, we like to challenge ourselves and we didn't have enough of you know, looking through all of those lessons, but mainly because the um, uh, the focus of our project is really, besides giving the, student, the American students the chance to practice the language, is also um, it has also strong focus on uh, teacher training. We thought that we should spoil the situation to give um, the graduate students in the department here also a chance to have a similar experience of that the one that the teachers, the student teachers in Italy had. So therefore, instead of just asking them to collect the material and put it you know, nicely together in uh, nice folders, we actually um, asked them to observe. They had access to all of the material from this year and last year. 
We ask them to observe, reflect, and analyze the material produced by the three service teachers, to choose examples of activities for specific goals, and we will show you, you know, where we put it and, and why. Uh, so, for example, how to review vocabulary, what to do with a reading, etc. So they had to choose. They were responsible to go through all those lessons and choose. Because that wasn't enough, so we asked them to <laughs> recover material from last year. There were some stuff hanging from um, other students who worked with me last year, like some reading, some good uh, in-depth uh, research on topics, cultural topics that um, had been researched based on what the students, uh, my students, said. So that material was there, and nobody used it. So I told them to go at it and do something with it, and we will show you. And then we asked them to actually create lessons on cultural topics. So using the same similar structure that I showed you, they had to come up um, with their own like, teaching unit all together. Uh, and we put it all on this website that we called Piazza Digitale. Piazza, as you know, in, in, in Italy is the place where we meet and, and uh, chat and exchange ideas. That's where we spend time, a lot of time. So I wanted to create a space where uh, we could go back and find, like a pedagogical space, uh, where we could go back and find uh, material. Now, the, the target of this page is, maybe it's not <laughs> you because you're all experienced teachers, but it's mainly uh, the other graduate students in my department. I wanted to give them another place, another source, where to find uh, some material and where to find some ideas. Um, and also where to find material, ready-made, ready material that they could download. But also, um, let me show you. Um, where they could go. And um, Massimiliano is going to talk a little more because they actually, it, the page contains all of the work that has been selected and created by them, so I think it's more fair that uh, he talks about it and also maybe to give his perspective on the whole thing. But um, this is how we divide it for now. Um, it's not done, it's not finished, but we have a cultural section um, that contains this handouts done by Massimiliano and Beatrice, who's the other graduate student uh, from Colombia who worked uh, with me, with us. We have a page for games with uh, vocabulary Grammar reviews, tons of grammar reviews we have, and then guess what? When I have a review, I go and I write it again, and I forget how many grammar reviews I have done already. Um, and then this is maybe the other important section of this of this website: the ideas for the class. This is where I want the students, the graduate students here, to go to if they are short on ideas. And what do I do? How do I? You know, what do I do to? have my students talk, what do we do with the vocabulary, what can I do, um, what kind of warming up, what, what activities, and these are all um, activities, Massimiliano is going to show you some of them, um, they're all from the lessons of the teachers in, uh, in Italy. Um, the idea is that, um, you know, as I said, I, I want the graduate students here to have another tool, where to go, another space, where to go, because Yes, they do the pedagogy course, but then they're overwhelmed with, uh, you know, their own seminars and courses and exams, and um, you know, also they never in my department they don't teach, um, they only teach elementary and intermediate, so they never teach higher level courses. Um, so I, I wanted to challenge them a little bit more with something else and how to work with the material. Uh, I don't know if Massimiliano wants to show you a little more um, of what they have done. Of course, I'm, you know, because it's, I've worked so much on this project, I'm always very excited. I don't know if Massimiliano. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, Massimiliano, I will be very short because I know we are close to the end of the event. And um, I was asked to tell you my perspective on this project. Uh, it was really an amazing experience for me. And so I want to thank Federica, but also the Language Resource Center for making it possible. Uh, I've been a language instructor since 2012. I started teaching at UNC Chapel Hill, where I also received my professional uh, pedagogical training. Uh, I devised syllabi, and I also devised my own uh, uh, activities and uh, 
uh, but I never had a chance, as Federico was saying, to actually um, uh, see how an advanced uh, uh, Italian uh, course was structured, especially uh, one that was using Skype uh, to actually uh, teach students. So it was really an amazing experience for me um, already from the get-go in that sense. And then, of course, uh, there is a reflective uh, component to it, uh, which uh, was really important insofar as we are uh, we are teaching here, we know our students, so we know what will work and what will not work, kind of. We know uh, how to structure our course, uh, but we rarely get a chance of adapting other people's, well, we, we have the textbook, but uh, when you are exposed to so many activities done by other instructors who, who all have their uh, teaching strategies and, um, and uh, style, uh, it is uh, extremely interesting uh, to, to actually uh, reflect and see through you know, the same practice from different eyes and then of course take that material and uh, revamp it, uh, rework it uh, in order to make it available for, for other uh, graduate students. Uh, so, um, um, yes, um, okay. So part of my work was to create uh, some uh, worksheets uh, that would have been uh, available, uh, will be available on, uh, on this platform, uh, and that will be uh, used by graduate students here at Columbia to teach. Uh, and so I would, oh no, oh sorry. Um, yes. So I would like to show you uh, this one, for example. So uh, I had to, one of the things that I had to do was looking at uh, what topics uh, are American students interested in in terms of Italian culture, and based on them, sometimes new worksheets, or sometimes, uh, again, revamp and, uh, and edit uh, um, other worksheets done by, by, by other um, instructors. Uh, this one is Storia della Pizza. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you have already, I know, it's almost uh, dinner time here in America, so, all right. Um, <laughs> I, uh, no graphic I'm not, no graphic designer, but I try to do a clean job that would allow students, first of all, of course, to, uh, um, you know, uh, re uh, review the, the basic uh, vocabulary uh, that will be needed in order to complete the, the whole set, the whole uh, worksheet. Um, here, uh, you know, I, uh, I try to find different kinds of uh, breads that, were, that are done in Italy that are typical. Uh, make them also, you know, reflect on them, try to describe them uh, through the format and of course then associate the name so that they would have the vocabulary. And lastly, very importantly, uh, since we have of course a student-centered communicative approach to, to language teaching, uh, I wanted also uh, for them to have a moment where in couple uh, they could exchange, uh, you know, part, well, all, all worksheets are structured in this way. In, uh, in, in this moment here they have a chance of uh, talking with each other uh, using the vocabulary that was presented earlier about their own uh, past experience. So here I'm asking them to find their tradi cultural tradition or geographical, uh, you know, uh, place of belonging, uh, something uh, that is a typical bread that they, they use, and to describe it using the vocabulary uh, presented earlier uh, to their to their friend. Uh, and um, and at this point they are they are ready to read about the story, the story della pizza, and the story of pizza. Uh, so in this case, uh, I, I found this article, I adapted it, because of course uh, uh, we have to edit uh, stuff for our students um, and to make it effective, then there is a true-false, etc, etc. And in the last page uh, we, we, we have uh, an, another uh, conversation, uh, again introducing new vocabulary that should already be there in the mind of students, especially if they are uh, studying an advanced Italian course, but in, in this case this is for intermediate. Uh, and in the end they have the role play where they actually have to write a flyer for their own restaurant and they have to uh, describe in a very catchy way their own pizza. Why should people come to your restaurant? And in the end they also have a competition where they have to read it out loud and then uh, the students are going to vote uh, what restaurant uh, they would like to eat in according to the description. Uh, so. Um, we, we, we tried uh, to, I think we should explain, I mean, they, they are, they're fun, they're engaging, uh, we tried to, to, to uh, devise material that could be used at different levels uh, and uh, of course also adapted according to the, uh, to, the, to the class. So for example, one of the things that we, uh, we tried not to do is to base them on grammar uh, because we wanted them, uh, we wanted uh, this worksheet to be available um, and to be adaptable according to the, to the grammar points introduced so that it would be like a, a cultural, um, 
object, so to say, or exploration of something, and then uh, it would be associated to the to the grammar concept. Um, I will show you just another one very quickly, so that you can have an idea. Uh, where is it? Okay, I will show you the only elementary one that we have so far, which is the concerto nel primo maggio, a big concept that happens in Italy uh, every first of May. And so here again, you have a basic vocabulary for uh, instruments, um, and then you, you the band, uh, and then the reading. So we always have a, a true content, a realia here, might be a video, might be a song, uh, and then activities associated with it and are open in the end. Um, so, I just want to show you uh, the other, I think, very valuable uh, element of this website, which is Idea della Classe, that Federico was talking about it earlier. Uh, we had to go through so much material, and uh, in the end... Uh, That's what I did here. <laughs> We, 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 we kind of um, uh, wanted to isolate uh, and uh, single out and use uh, those activities, those, those ideas uh, uh, that would have been more uh, innovative in, in terms of, not innovative, but uh, uh, particular. Uh, we tend to, uh, at a certain point, uh, teach uh, in a similar way and use what we know works, but there are other people that have other ideas, use um, uh, um, supports differently. Uh, and so formats differently, and so uh, those formats uh, we wanted to single out in order to, uh, uh, to, to, to sparkle the imagination of, of new TAs. Um, and for example, I have here the ones that I wanted to show you. Do you have one that I... I... Yeah, I idee per parlare. Sì, idee per parlare, Conversazione con un dado I wanted to show. So, uh, so ideas to talk, to make them talk. This is a com uh, conversation that happens uh, thanks to the dice, to two dice. Uh, so you have a format here that, uh, you know, this is just a basis, you know, like a base structure, uh, but uh, an instructor can come here and say, oh, today I might have them talk using this format. How interesting. And so you kind of adapt your own activity uh, in, uh, in light of this one. Uh, another one that I wanted to show you is a uh, warm-up. Hypothesis. So, for example, another format that was interesting that I encountered was, uh, is to offer students three images and then tell them, okay, what do you think these flyers uh, are sponsoring? What are they all about? And start a conversation around that. Um, so, yes, it's a big repository for ideas. Of course, it has to be further expanded, but uh, it was a great uh, experience for me, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. All of this and what I was saying before, obviously, all of these are, you know, uh, things that we know, we do, and we have used. But I don't know if it happens to you, but sometimes I tend, like Massimiliano was saying, I tend to use the, for example, even as for a reading comprehension, I tend to do like true and false. Okay. Um, what about like, uh, it, like um, this one had um, present and absent, like the. You know, if the, is the information there or not, which is different. And I never use it, I never do it. I never do, I, you know, it's another way of testing if, you know, the reading comprehension. And so the idea is just to put all of this, um, all of this idea uh, together so that, you know, if you want to change something, at the student, the graduate students, if you, if you want, if you have to design an activity, you know what options you have, you know, how to introduce a topic, how to work with the vocabulary, we have a lot, um, you know, matching with word and images, crucial puzzle, uh, word and definition. I, I know it sounds so very easy for us, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the graduate students are aware of all of the options that they have to test the vocabulary or review the vocabulary. Um, and it all comes from the lessons designed by other uh, teachers in training. We have, we're still working on other sections, and uh, we have a grammar, you know, a bunch of grammar uh, handouts. And all of them, um, I'm not sure if Massignan said, all of them is like they can be, um, you know, you click and you can download it and it's done, it's ready, you can go and use it. And that's done also for the, the, the vocabulary. We have the list of vocabulary that you can 
work, um, and this is based on the general vocabulary that you do when you talk about, for example, immigration. We, used, uh, we have the Kahoot, that's from last year project. I had some students preparing some, I don't know if you're familiar with Kahoot, but it's an online game. Uh, so it's done, it's there, it's up. Why am I not, why am I be doing it again five minutes before class? So it's there, and then I, we added a crutch puzzle, and that's here. Uh, you know, it's done. Oops. Okay, no, it's. But it's done, and you can print it out and go to class and use it. So, um, Probably, I, I don't know, I guess we need to 
not much. Just... I, I know there is a Sokolovia, you know, limitations, and I'm, I'm not sure about that. It would be interesting to so the source to allow other people to upload activities. <laughs> that more. was another idea. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that was another idea because I also had other graduate students working with me last year. We did a different type of, um, you know, collaboration, but they, uh, there's also part of the work, the work has been recovered, but there's also tons of other stuff that they have done that I would like to put on this, this place now that I have it. Um, but yeah, maybe invite other people to collaborate or I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know also because of Colombia. I know originally I was all going to use ED blog, and ED blog has a lot of restrictions. You have to be uh, within Colombia community. So mm, I, I'm not sure about this. We, well, we can talk about this later. <laughs> has a question. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating presentation and fascinating project. My question is about the initial. How did you initially motivate Italian? Uh, students on the Italian side to participate in this project because their contribution, their, their class plans and that they develop is enormous yeah. and it was very time consuming, sure, for sure. What was their motivation? So well, I mean, they're at the beginning of their career, so it's all in their interest, whatever we ask them to do. it's. Uh, they, they have no experience at all. Some of them never taught. So even teaching, like designing the lessons uh, from the original, original, like before the project, they just had to design a unit, which was a you know a theoretical unit that who knows if they ever used. Um, now they got a chance to actually test it. And I'm not sure about you, but I, I remember when I started <laughs> teaching, any chance was for me precious to uh, you know to learn and you know they're they're good handouts they're not perfect we have there are some things to, to correct so I, we did ask them if they wanted you know to be considered for for this website I always do ask them and that's why they send it or they don't send you it. Might, you might consider giving their uh, consent forms. Oh you mean for, like yes, for posting or using the materials. Yeah. That's one of the things. Yeah. I, I don't think they would go back. I mean, the, for now, what there is is only just one activity. For example, this. It's all, the, the lessons have been broken down, so there's only one piece, one activity from one whole lesson, but yes, I, I yeah. But there are many spacings. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why I, I still kept it uh, closed access for now, because yeah, we, we have to work it out. And the image copyright, you also have to probably check that, whether they use the yeah. source images and that's like huge. Mm -hmm. I know, but you know, that's, I mean, the, I think the website is more, you know, of a source a thought for my, for the graduate students in my department, rather than like a project like yours, which yes. is maybe something that, you, you know, you will publish or you will, you know, the other schools we use. This was a more of a gain experience and more of like collecting the work and giving the graduate students the chance to have the similar experience. But you know, I finally wanted to put it somewhere because otherwise it's all up in the air. Um, it, it doesn't have the aspiration of, of your project. Um, so, but yeah, I know this. This is a, I, I know that's a huge. Even just one single image, and I'm, I'm sure they they use all kinds of. Thank you for your presentation. That was good. Um, that was fun. So hopefully, um, you got a chance to see what your colleagues are doing. Um, and hopefully, found inspiring, whether it is developing materials for graduate students or applying mapping and GIS technologies to uh, teach language and to get insights into language and such or uh, developing materials from scratch or lesson taught language that are also applicable to distance learning and distance teaching. Um, I hope that you found this evening valuable and that uh, I will, we will all receive applications from you 
for more projects uh, next semester and next round of funding. Thank you so much. Yeah.